statics and dynamics. I'll start this video by essentially mapping out this entire course and how everything is related. I am not sure how good I did at this, but I gave it my best shot. We'll see where that goes. But electromagnetics can roughly be divided into statics and dynamics. In statics, nothing's changing, nothing is moving, and there's some profound implications that has. So we'll talk about the conditions for that and what comes out of that. So let's map this course. And of course, it all starts with Maxwell's equations. Everything in this course will come out of Maxwell's equations and also the constitutive relations. And you'll see a little bit later, one other equation called the Lorentz force law. So Maxwell's equations, the constitutive relations and the Lorentz force law describes all of classical electromagnetics. And so here's a map of really how all of that comes out of this. The first thing we will do is see what happens to Maxwell's equations when we set that frequency term to zero. Or if we were looking at Maxwell's equations in the time domain, we would set all of the time derivatives to zero. One thing we'll see is that Maxwell's equation splits into two independent sets of equations when we set the frequency term to zero. Half of those equations have all electric field terms and that's what describes all of electrostatics. The other half of those equations contain all magnetic field terms, and that's what describes all of magnetostatics. From there, we'll start with Gauss's law, and we'll solve this for D essentially, and talk about the field around a point charge. We will then generalize that concept and talk about fields around charge distributions. We'll go back to the curl equation and for the static approximation, we can define a scalar function called the electric potential. And in fact, we can solve problems in terms of the scalar quantity instead of the vector quantity E. But what we'll see is the electric field intensity and the electric potential are the same physical phenomenon, just two different mathematical ways to describe that. And of course, we prefer scalar equations, so we will go with that. In fact, we'll derive a differential equation called Laplace's equation, and we will use this to analyze devices. So armed with Laplace's equations and fields around charge distributions, we will analyze electrostatic devices like resistors, parallel plate capacitors, and those types of things. At that point, we move on to magnetostatics, and in many ways, we'll parallel what we did for electrostatics. We'll look at the curl equation, Ampere circuit law, and we will calculate the field around a differential current element. We will call that the Biot-Savart law. From there, we can look at the magnetic fields around line currents, surface currents, and volume currents. Then pops in the Lorentz force law, from which we can calculate the forces on line currents, surface currents, and volume currents. And this leads into like electric motors and those types of things. We won't cover those applications in this course, but we have to understand the forces on charges and currents. Then given the fields around the different current distributions, we can analyze magnetostatic devices, such as inductors. At that point, we'll move on to dynamics, and we will combine Maxwell's curl equations to derive what's called the wave equation. We will solve that, and we will get the equation for a wave, and that leads into the discussion of waves and polarization. We'll then have that wave incident onto a medium, and we'll see that waves reflect. We'll understand why they reflect. We'll start talking a little bit more about polarization, TE, TM, plane of incidence, angle of incidence, Snell's law, refraction, and those topics. Similar to waveguides, we will talk about transmission lines, and we'll talk about how Maxwell's equations can be reduced to circuit theory, and we just have the scalar terms voltage and current, 
and we can analyze transmission lines. And this mirrors very much like what we do for waves. We can jump back to the wave equation and start analyzing waveguides and calculating modes in the waveguides and look at how they propagate through the waveguides. We will also build on transmission lines a little bit and talk about Smith charts. And this is a really neat way to visualize some of the really weird things that happens on transmission lines and high frequency circuits. Conditions to apply the static approximation. Well, of course, the first condition for the static approximation is if it is truly static. Is our frequency zero? So we're at DC and literally nothing is changing. If we have Maxwell's equations in the frequency domain form, we set this omega term to zero. If we have Maxwell's equations in the time domain form, we would set all of the time domain derivatives to zero. So of course that's the obvious one, but there's another condition. If the size of the device that we are analyzing is very small compared to the wavelength, then we can use an electrostatic approximation to analyze things. And in fact, you've probably already done this. You analyzed AC circuits. Our circuit, if it is much, much smaller than the wavelength, then we can just use ordinary circuit theory to analyze this. Remember one of the fundamental things we assumed in a circuit is that the voltage is constant along a conductor. Well, if we have a wave traveling along that conductor, it stands to reason that that voltage would vary, and it absolutely does. However, if the size of the circuit is very small, then that variation is small enough that we can still apply ordinary circuit theory. And by the way, we could modify circuit theory to analyze larger circuits that are large relative to the wavelength, and that's called network theory. It's a generalization to circuit theory that accounts for the wave nature of the wave. So the rule of thumb here is if the size of your device is less than a tenth of a wavelength, then we can apply ordinary circuit theory. And that's just a rule of thumb. There may be times where if you're interested in the six digit of precision, this isn't good enough and maybe you should ensure that your circuit is a hundredth of a wavelength or something like that. But roughly, if you're less than a tenth of a wavelength, you can apply the static approximation. Let's do a quick example to illustrate this concept. Let's say we have a circuit that is four centimeters wide. The question is, what's the maximum frequency that we can operate this circuit so that we can still apply ordinary circuit theory in order to design and analyze it. First thing is we have to identify the largest dimension. Maybe it would have been better here to look at the diagonal of that circuit because that's a little bit larger than four centimeters. But for easy numbers, let's just stick with the four centimeters. That means that the minimum wavelength we can handle is 10 times that dimension. We would like our wavelength to be at least 10 times larger than four centimeters. So the minimum wavelength that we could get away with is 40 centimeters. At this point, we can solve for the maximum frequency from that minimum wavelength. So speed of light divided by the minimum wavelength gives us the maximum frequency. So 750 megahertz. If this circuit operates at 750 megahertz and below, we can apply ordinary circuit theory to analyze and design it. For frequencies above that, we would have to do other things. Consequences of static approximation. Here we're looking at Maxwell's equations in their general form. So we see that we have time derivatives here and frequency. If we make the static approximation, that means we set all of the time derivatives to zero and we set omega to zero everywhere. So those terms will completely drop out of Maxwell's equations. They're gone. And then if we analyze this long enough, what we'll see is that Maxwell's equations have decoupled into two sets of equations. Let's talk about those two sets of equations. 
First, we have the equations that contain only electric field terms. These are the equations we'll proceed with for electrostatics. And looking at these equations, we can learn some things. First is this first divergence equation. The only way that we can have electric fields in an electrostatics problem is if there is charge present. No charge, no fields. We can look at the curl equation, and this says the curl of E equals zero. That means that the electric field cannot circulate. It can't form loops. And that means it's mostly straight lines. Yes, they'll curl and they'll fringe, but they essentially form these almost straight lines from some positive charge to some negative charge. They can't loop around back onto themselves. The other thing is the only material properties here is permittivity. So in electrostatics, the electric fields do not see permeability at all. Then we move on to magnetostatics. These are the equations containing only magnetic field terms. And if we look at these, we can make some observation. First of all, if we look at Ampere's circuit law, the only way we can have magnetic fields in magnetostatics is if there is an electrical current. We can look at the divergence equation and we see that the magnetic flux cannot have divergence. It always must form loops. If it doesn't have divergence, it can't have a start or an end, yet it must exist, so it has to form loops. We also see that the only property here is permeability. So magnetic fields in the static approximation do not see permittivity. This has one really neat application. We can set up a wireless communications link into a cave that's going through rock and concrete that's really wet and lossy because all of that stuff is primarily described by the permittivity. The permeability is essentially air, so magnetic fields can penetrate through that. And as long as we set up a link that has very, very low frequencies associated with it, so we can essentially make the static approximation, we can communicate through those obstacles because the magnetic fields are not seeing or experiencing the super lossy permittivity. 